Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, I'm going to be doing a brief overview of some of the hand tools and power tools that you'll find in ASU's FSC 100 eSpace Laboratory. Now although this video is primarily intended for students taking FSC 100, it's a good brief overview of general tools and other adhesives and other properties and skills that you may need for basic fabrication, and even if you're not in the class, I urge you to continue watching if you'd like to learn these types of topics. Now in addition to tools, as I mentioned, I'm going to also go into some basic adhesive uh, information as well as some information on how to fasten different materials together. So let's get started. So to start off this tutorial, I'll begin with one of the simplest and oldest tools, the hammer. Now a hammer can be used for multiple purposes, including driving nails through two pieces of wood to fasten them together, or for uh, crushing or smashing materials up uh, for uh, use in other applications of a project. Now if you're going to fasten two pieces of wood together, before considering using nails, I recommend considering screws. Although nails are very effective at holding pieces of wood together in shear, that is moving side to side, they're not very effective at holding wood together in tension. If you use a nail and you pull two pieces of wood together, it's relatively easy to pull them apart when compared to an equivalent screw. That being said, there may be a project in which you actually do need to use a nail, and uh, it's fairly self-explanatory how a hammer and nail work, but a few things to keep in mind. You want to be sure that the nail is, is short enough that it's not going to stick out the bottom of the piece after it's been driven through, and you also want to make sure it's long enough that it makes, good, uh, it makes a sufficiently deep penetration into the uh, second piece of wood that you're attaching so that it makes a strong enough bond. When you're hammering, you always want to make sure that uh, you start out with small taps and progressively make the taps larger so that you don't accidentally hit your fingers really hard on the first go. A second variety of hammer is called a dead blow hammer. Now as the name implies, striking with a dead blow hammer will create very little bounce back when compared to a traditional metal hammer. The way this is done is this plastic coated hammer has a cylinder that's filled with bird shot and when it strikes the object, the bird shot smashes into the inside of the cylinder which prevents the hammer from bouncing back up. This can be useful if you want to apply percussive force to an object without your hammer bouncing off or flying in the other direction. It also increases the overall force applied per strike to the object. Now a dead blow hammer does have a soft plastic cover for shock absorption, which means it should not be used to hammer nails. Trying to drive nails with this will quickly uh, chew up the plastic on the end and damage it. It's best to use a metal hammer for driving in nails. Now in addition, any set of hammers should always be used with safety glasses, especially the metal variety. If this hammer strikes a hardened metal object, it will chip, or it could potentially chip, and those chips can fly out at such incredibly high speed that they could cause severe eye injury if they hit it. So you always want to make sure and wear goggles when you're hammering with a metalized hammer. Now I'm going to cover tools that are used for gripping and compressing objects. The first and most basic of which is the pair of pliers. Now pliers are used for pressing objects together or gripping onto objects. They have a center portion which can be used to grip onto rounded off objects and two flat portions which can be used to grip onto flat objects. They also have a setting for a wider diameter application or for narrower diameter applications. A more specialized type of pliers are the needle nose pliers which can be used for fine manipulation of objects and picking up small or uh, manipulating other small objects. Another specialty type of pliers are called the vice grips. These are effectively a clamping plier. If, for example, I take this piece of MDF and stick the vice grip over it like this, by tightening down, I've now bonded or I've now attached the pliers permanently to this piece of wood until I release the clamp. This way I don't have to keep holding the pliers down to make a good grip. When I'm ready, I hold the piece and I take this lever on the bottom and release them. Now one of the things I'd like to mention is that pliers are no substitute for a proper wrench when unscrewing a bolt or a nut. In this case, if I want to take this nut off, the best thing to do is to find a properly sized socket wrench which fits around the nut and is set in the correct direction to unscrew it. However, unfortunately, I believe our eSpace is not equipped with a socket wrench set, so you may be forced instead to use 
a crescent wrench or adjustable wrench as it's also called. To use an adjustable wrench, simply line the wrench up on the nut, tighten the threads down until it's snug, and then you can unscrew the nut. Now adjustable wrenches tend to strip uh, bolts a little bit more severely, just like pliers do. However, they're certainly better at gripping than pliers, uh, better at gripping bolts, because the horizontal axis of movement is fixed on a crescent wrench. Whereas on a pair of pliers, it's only the leverage exerted by your hands that allows this axis of pressure to be applied. Thus, even an adjustable wrench is a much better solution to turning a bolt than a pair of pliers is. Now the last tool I'm going to cover here is, the, this is a clamp, a wood table clamp, and this can be used to fix an object to the side of a workbench so that it can be drilled or cut. Additionally, if two objects are going to be glued together, for example, if I were to glue these two pieces of wood together, you can use a clamp like this to grip on, like so, and by tightening the bolt or tightening the screw, you can secure the pieces together so that when they glue, when the, when the glue adheres, it's uh, fixed together and you don't have to sit and hold the two together while the glue is curing. Next, I'm going to be covering a few tools that allow cutting of materials. A basic all-purpose handsaw is, the, is called the hacksaw. This saw works by holding a blade in tension using a tensioning nut, and it's excellent for making uh, direct straight cuts through a variety of materials, including wood, plastic, and light gauge metal. Here's an example of something you might use the hacksaw to cut. If you're looking to shorten or truncate a bolt, what you want to do is clamp that bolt in a vise, take the hacksaw, if you've previously marked where you want to cut the bolt, you may want to uh, mark that and make it flush with the side of the vise so you can cut uh, adjacent to the vise. And all you have to do is and there you have it. The end of the bolt has been removed and the remainder of the bolt is still in the vise. Before making a cut through wood with a miter saw, you're going to want to mark the location of your cut using a square and a pencil or a pen on the wood. So if you've measured out the distance you want to cut, use the square to line up a perpendicular line across it. This is the line that you're going to follow with your saw. And once you've made that mark, then you can take the miter saw, line it up carefully with the mark, and you can begin cutting. The miter saw is an excellent tool for making perpendicular cuts to a piece of wood because once you've marked the location, the saw inherently only cuts in one axis. So you can be sure your uh, your if your if your line was square to the wood, then your cut is also going to be square. In certain cases, if you want to make a predefined angle, such as a 45 degree or 90 degree angle in a piece of wood, you'll also use what's called a miter box. A miter box is not shown here. However, uh, we have them in the lab and all you'll do to use that is you'll set your wood inside the miter box and cut at whatever angle uh, it has predefined uh, grooves in the box. In case you're wondering, this is also called a back saw because of this, uh, this groove or this uh, bracket on the back to add extra stability to the blade. The next tool we're going to look at is called a coping saw. Now a coping saw is similar to a hack saw, however it has a much deeper throat depth and the blade is very thin which allows curved cuts in wood and plastic to be made easily. So I'll show you a demonstration. For this demonstration, I've mounted a piece of, uh, piece of wood vertically in a vise. You can also clamp it to the side of the table, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to show it vertical in, in the vertical orientation. So if you want to make a curved cut, line up your coping saw on the side of the line that you, want to, uh, that you, that you don't want. You want to always save the line on the part of the piece that you want. Start the cut, and you can rotate the saw so that the throat of the saw is in line with the direction you want to cut. And now we've made a curved cut in a piece of wood. Another tool you may encounter in the lab is the file. Files are used for subtractively removing small amounts of material from the edges and inside corners of uh, the piece you're working on. Now there are a few different kinds of files. There are half rounded, half flat files, flat files that are flat on both sides, fully rounded circular files, 
and triangular and other geometric shaped files. One of the things you may want to pay attention to with files is the coarseness of the cutting material. This is a very coarse file, as you can see here if I move it up close, and this is good for primarily softer materials like wood and possibly plastic. On the other hand, you have very fine files like this one. This is best uh, to be used with metal and other harder materials. Now I'm going to show you a powered cutting tool. This is called a jigsaw or saber saw. It's effectively uh, an, a powered equivalent of the coping saw in that it uses a reciprocating blade to cut curved or straight angles through a piece of wood. This can also be used for plastics, however, because the blade is quite coarse, it's not well suited to metals, and trying to cut metals with this saw will likely dull the blade. So to set this up, I'm going to be making this pre-marked curved cut on this 2x4. What we want to do is we want to take our friend the clamp, and we want to attach this 2x4 to the side of the workbench. So I'll zoom in the camera so you can see. So now we want to clamp onto the surface of the wood. So you can extend your clamp using this lever at the bottom, and you want to clamp the wood to the edge of the table. Now slide it out so that you have maybe four to five inches of available space for the back of the saw to swing around, and clamp the clamp down onto the piece as tightly as you can. Now because this is a somewhat slick table, there will still be potentially a little bit of side-to-side -side movement. If your piece starts to move while you are cutting, you can always put another hand on the other side of it. Just be sure that your hand is well away from the cutting location of the blade to prevent any injuries. So now what we're going to do is begin the cut. You want to try and save the line on the side that you're going to be finishing because you can always finish it down to the very edge of the line using sandpaper or a belt sander later on. So now we'll begin. see I preserved the line in, in the entire length of the cut that way we can sand it down to finish later on. As you notice I did have to place one hand on the other side of the, bo of the board to stabilize it but I made sure that I was still in control of the saw at all times. The next tool I'm going to be showing you is the hand drill. This is a powered tool that applies rotational force to a bit or other object that's inserted into the chuck. The chuck is the part of the drill it uses three fingers that can be tightened down or loosened so that they change their dimension and compress down on a drill bit or other object. Now in our lab we have two different types of drills. There are uh, powered corded drills and there are battery operated drills. For almost all applications I recommend the corded drill. However, if you need a lot of portability or if you want to do some more fine work that requires less torque, such as drilling screws into wood, you may want to use the battery operated drill. But for the sake of argument, I'm going to show you this power drill since it's what I have on hand now. Now to operate the chuck on this drill, all you have to do is insert the drill bit, and you may have to loosen the chuck out a little bit by turning the end of it. So loosen out the chuck, Oops. insert the drill bit, make sure that the uh, chuck doesn't sit down on the flutes, that is the little grooves cut in the bit. You want to just have it sit on the rounded off edge and manually tighten the drill uh, chuck down. Give it a good twist and your bit is secure. Now on some drills, you can't rotate it by hand. Instead, you use what's called a chuck key. That engages with a geared uh, lever mechanism that tightens the chuck down uh, automatically. It's a sort of rack and pinion between two gears. In this case, we don't need to use that, however, because it's a manually uh, hand-operated chuck. Now when you're drilling through a piece of wood, it's very important to make sure the location where you're drilling is not directly above the table. If you drill through here, you're going to end up putting a hole in the table, and you don't want to do that. Instead, you always want to just make sure if you follow through your drill 
that uh, you're not going to come out uh, on the table itself, that you come out off the edge. Once again, keeping the wood clamped is a good idea. Now normally you'd want to mark the location of your drill hole ahead of time. Since this is just a demonstration though, I'm just going to put it right here in the middle. So squeeze the trigger slowly until the drill bit starts to spin. And there's something you noticed. It started rotating, but it didn't cut. Let me show you that again. Now why is that? Well, the reason is the drill is currently set to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. Most drill bits are what are called right hand turn, meaning they have to turn clockwise to cut. On the drill, there's a small lever that you can click over like this to put it into counterclockwise or clockwise drive. Now we can drill the hole much more effectively. I'll stop it for a moment to show you what I'm doing. I'm holding, let me move the camera up as well. As I'm drilling, I'm putting my thumb and fingers around the top of the drill while I squeeze the drill with the other hand, while I squeeze the trigger with the other hand. This gives you maximum uh, stability on the tool so that it doesn't wobble around or present a safety hazard. So we'll go back down to the workpiece and take another look there. And we'll continue drilling through. As you can see, we've broken through. If I remove the clamp, you can see we've relatively cleanly gone through the wood. So that's how you drill a twist, a twist drill bit using the ele corded electric hand drill. When operating any type of power tool, it's always important to wear uh, safety glasses. There are very fast rotating motors inside of these tools that uh, can potentially cause debris to be thrown from the tool itself, and during the cutting process, wood, plastic, or metal chips may go flying into the air. If you need to measure the diameter of a circular object, inside or outside, you may want to use the calipers. To make an outside diameter measurement, just put the piece that you're working on between the two uh, arms of the caliper, rotate it around to make sure that you've gotten the dimension on the uh, widest dimension on all sides, and measure from the mark within this box. The ones in the lab have a digital display that reads the units in either millimeters or inches. If you'd like to measure the inside diameter of an object, you can use these parts of the caliper. So put it inside the object. Once again, rotate the object and uh, apply some pressure so that you get the closest dimension possible and read off of the indicator again. I'm going to briefly mention a few different types of adhesive before we proceed with the electronics section of this video. Here I have shown wood glue, two-part epoxy, and superglue, or cyanoacrylate. We'll start with wood glue. This is a relatively slow drying glue, but it tends to form very strong bonds between porous materials. So wood, paper type products, those types of things are ideal for uh, wood glue applications. This is epoxy, which is a much more universal type of adhesive. Epoxy can be used for diff all different materials, metals, plastics, wood, uh, all different things like that, and it's very fast drying. Once the two parts have been mixed, it starts a chemical reaction wherein polymers begin cross-linking, and within five minutes it reaches near, uh, nearly full cure, and within a few hours it eventually reaches full cure. Superglue or cyanoacrylate is a very fast application type of glue. It usually takes between one and four hours to dry, it actually uses water as the, in, from the air as the curing material. Now superglue has excellent strength in tension. Just a few square inches can purportedly lift an entire car if in direct tension. However, it has relatively weak shearing strength. So if, something, if two pieces of material twist or pry apart and they're held together by superglue, it doesn't work very well and is probably not ideal for the application. Additionally, you want to be careful with superglue not to get it on skin because since skin contains water, applying superglue to it and sticking your fingers together will very quickly get them stuck, and it can be quite difficult and require lots of acetone to dissolve the glue. Additionally, what I haven't shown here is a material called PVC solvent adhesive. It's effectively a solvent that melts the plastic of PVC pipe together and allows for pipe to be strongly bonded together. It doesn't really work very well for other materials, however, so I didn't show it on this bench. Next, we're going to have a look at a couple of multimeters. 
Now the purpose of a multimeter is to measure an electrical characteristic. In this case, both of these meters can measure DC and AC voltage. Uh, it can measure, they can both measure DC current and they can both measure uh, resistance and continuity. This one also has the added feature of being able to measure capacitance and inductance. Now this, and this one can additionally measure AC current. Now this is the relatively low end meter that you'll find in the upper drawers of your lab station. And this meter is effective for just general purpose measurements and troubleshooting. For example, we can use this to measure the voltage on this six volt battery. By setting this, uh, this dial to 20 volts DC, you always want to set it to the range higher than what you're going to measure. We can measure the nominal value of this battery. So what you want to do is put the red to the positive and the black to the negative, and you'll see this battery is quite heavily discharged. It's just under five volts. Now one thing you can do if you're uh, curious as to what the polarity of an unknown DC voltage source is, you can flip these around and try the other way. This time you get a little negative symbol in the corner. That indicates that the voltage is negative relative to this negative and positive terminal, meaning the black is on a more positive uh, voltage and relative to the red. Now you can also perform a similar task with this red multimeter, or with this uh, high-end multimeter, I should say. So we set that to 20 volts. We take the measurement, and it looks like it's a bit different, 4.87. So it is possible that one of these multimeters is somewhat out of calibration. Now one thing that's very important to notice on both of these multimeters is you have to make certain that when you're taking a voltage measurement, the red test lead is in the volt ohm milliamp section of the meter. If you have this on the 10 amp DC setting and you try to measure across a voltage source, it will short circuit and potentially uh, damage the meter. If on the other hand you have it in the milliamp setting and you also have the switch set to this DC amp setting, you'll blow the fuse in the meter if you try to measure a voltage source directly. When you're using the current measuring settings on either of the multimeters, you always want to make sure there's some sort of a resistive element between the battery and the multimeter, otherwise the fuse will blow. Now in addition to these settings, this uh, higher end meter, which is comparable to the larger meter underneath your lab stations, has the ability to measure inductance and capacitance. In this case, we're going to be measuring the capacitance of this nominal 7.5 microfarad capacitor. Now this is rated to plus or minus 6%, so it could be quite a bit higher. And in fact, from my previous measurement, I believe it is. So we'll take our measurement now and you see nothing's happening. That's because, as, it, as you can see on the screen, our wires are not in the correct spots for capacitance testing. To measure capacitance on this meter, you want to connect between the middle two uh, segments. It may be different from meter to meter, and this is not the exact type of meter that we have in the lab, so you'll have to check with your local meter to see what, uh, what the setting is for capacitance or inductance testing. So we'll try that again. And as you can see, we get 8.3 microfarads. As expected, it's a bit higher than 7.5 microfarads. So that's how you use a, uh, an LCR meter, as it's called, L being inductance, C being capacitance, R being resistance, and uh, how you measure voltage using any multimeter. Next, I'm going to go over some basics on how to operate a soldering iron and how to perform a good solder joint. So the first thing I'll show you are basic tools here. This soldering iron is slightly different from the one in the classroom in that the temperature control is on the iron itself rather than on a separate soldering station. It generally works the same way, however. What we have here is a, so uh, this is a soldering iron tip cleaner. You insert the tip into it to clean any solder or contaminants off of it to make it nice and clean. It's a good idea to have a clean tip on your soldering iron to make sure that your, bonds, your soldering joints and bonds are most effective. This is called a flux pen here. It has a flux material in it which uh, effectively wicks the solder and allows the solder to bond more cleanly to possibly oxidized surfaces. And the last thing, of course, is the solder itself. Now this is 6040 rosin core solder, meaning it's 60% tin and 40% lead. The solder in the classroom, I believe, is lead-free, so it's, 
I believe it's a mixture of tin and a few other trace uh, elements. But uh, in, in either case, it's a good idea to be sure and wash your hands before eating or uh, handling any food products after using any kind of solder. Also because you don't know what kind of solder the previous user of the iron was using as well. So next I'm going to show you how to bond two wires together. There's lots of different things you can do with the soldering iron, but this is one of the most basic. So the first thing you want to do is mechanically fasten the two together by twisting them. When you twist two pieces of wire together, it's best to try and get them so well twisted that you can almost suspend one from the other without it falling apart. Next, take your flux pen, remove the top, and apply a thin layer of flux as if you were just drawing on, on it with a, a permanent marker all the way around the surface. Put the cap back on the flux pen, and now what you want to do is put the wire in a, pos uh, in a position where you're not going to cause problems. In this case, I'm actually going to place a piece of wood under it since we're going to be applying the heat directly to it, and I don't want to burn the table again. <laughs> so now what we want to do is take the solder, or take the soldering iron and the solder, and you want to briefly apply the soldering iron to the junction and at the same time, you want to feed in the solder. Now what you want to do is gradually move the iron back and forth on the workpiece and basically watch for the workpiece to change color to the silver soldering color. Additionally, you want to put the soldering iron underneath it to get the back side and add a little bit of additional solder. Once you're done with that, allow it to cool and inspect your work. A high quality solder joint will allow you to just barely see the outline of the conductors underneath the solder. In fact, it should look almost as if you have a perfect outer coating, a perfect conformal coating of solder on the outside of the conductors. This assures an extremely robust and strong bond. I looped the wire back onto itself and I made a purposefully less than optimal solder joint, as, as you can see here. There's a big blob of solder indicating that far too much was used and it also is very uneven along the length of the joint. Although this wouldn't necessarily be that much weaker than this other uh, joint because it is fully coated, it does waste a lot of solder and it doesn't look as elegant as the other joint. Making high quality joints like this takes practice, so I always recommend trying a few solder joints on your own before working with your group on the actual project that you're going to be soldering. It's better to practice on some scrap copper wire that you don't need than to damage or adversely solder on your actual project wiring. At some point, you may also need to solder a piece of wire to a part of a printed circuit board. In this case, I'm going to be showing you how to solder this wire to the ground plane of this circuit board. That is this exposed area here where there's a uh, conformally coated solder mask on top, but a thin copper layer of actual uh, conductive material underneath. To do this, the first thing you're going to want to do is to take a knife and scrape the solder mask off of the top like so. You see that I'm exposing the metal underneath in the area where I'd like to solder. Now that I've exposed some metal, what I'm going to do now is apply some flux to that location, like so. This time you want to use quite a bit because it's very important that the solder sticks well to that surface. Now what I like to do when I'm soldering to a printed circuit board, not necessarily when I'm installing a component, but when I'm attaching a wire to it, is I like to pre-tin the area that I'm going to be soldering. So you can see here I've added some fresh solder on there and I'm also going to pre-tin the copper wire. So I'll just set it here and I'll apply solder to the end of the wire to get it all pre-tinned like so. As you can see, I've applied solder to the entire wire. Now what I'm going to do is line up the wire with the location that I'd like to solder and apply heat from the iron. Now wait until the entire puddle has melted and then release the iron, hold it in place and allow it to dry. Once the solder is solidified, you now have an extremely strong bond to this board. In fact, I can pick up the entire circuit board, like so, just by that solder joint. I can also pull on it quite hard and not have any concern about it popping off. So that's how you solder a piece of wire to the ground plane of a PCB. You may also decide that you want to salvage a component from a printed circuit board. As an example, let's try and remove this capacitor. So we'll go onto the bottom of the board and we'll identify where the capacitor pokes through. 
Based on the location of my hand on the other, other side, I can feel that the capacitor goes through between these two wires. So what you want to do is take your soldering iron and gradually melt one side. And once that side is melted, tilt the capacitor back so that the pin pulls through like I just did. Now wait for that solder to dry. And as you can see, the capacitor has, I've tilted the capacitor to the side. Let's get a good angle there. You see I've tilted the capacitor. Now melt the other side in the same fashion. And once it's liquid, tilt the capacitor to the other side. Allow that to dry. And if we look on the other side, we'll see that the capacitor is very close to being removable, but it is still hanging on a little bit. So we'll go back under and we'll remelt the first side again, like so. Now I've fully removed the capacitor and there it is. So now that this capacitor has been removed, you could use this in another application or you could put another component in its place. For example, a larger capacitor, a resistor, or some other passive element if you are modifying the function of the circuit board. Here's a component that you may find very helpful when prototyping your electronic devices. This is called a solderless breadboard. What this allows you to do is connect many different components together on a unified and stable surface. This is for uh, primarily for through hole components, that is components that have small wire legs that can go into these holes, and you can actually set integrated circuits across this center line. Now here are the basic principles of how a breadboard works. I'm not going to go into any extremely detailed aspects of it, but the basic, the basic principle is that each of these horizontal rows of holes, so each of these five holes running along the horizontal length of this board are connected together. So we have one, two, three, four, and lots and lots all the way down to, let's see, about 64 rows of five holes. Now they're only connected on this one side and they're not connected to these power rails over here. So between these two, we have up to 128 separate connections here. Now in addition to these, the two separate power rails, which by the way are removable as you can see, they can optionally be removed if you need to. Each of these power rails is connected along the length of the board, like so. So all of these along this red line are connected, and all of these along this blue line are connected. Now they are separate from one another, and both of these are separate from the other side, even from their respective color on the other side. So the red line, uh, the red bus bar, as it's called here, is separate from the red bus bar here which is also separate from the blue bus bar here, which is also separate from the blue bus bar here. All of these bus bars are also separate from each of the individual horizontal rows on the actual breadboard. So that's the basic principle of how a breadboard is configured. So now I've shown you examples of most of the major tools provided by ASU in the FSE 100 eSpace. Now in addition to these tools, occasionally, depending on my availability, I may bring in some additional tools from my own house that I've either built or acquired myself. The first example of this is my Energize Toolbox. This is a device that I built myself. It has 20 amp hours worth of lithium ion uh, batteries in it, and it has a 750 watt power inverter. This means it supplies 120 volts AC at up to 6.5 amps from these receptacles. This uh, gauge shows the battery voltage, which is on a scale from 10.5 volts up to 12.5 volts. And uh, additionally, if I turn it, there is a, uh, a neon light indicator to show if the inverter is operational. Additionally, on the back is an EC5 connector, that is this connector here, which provides direct access to the battery, allowing you to draw up to 200 amps at 12 volts or from this 12 volt barrel jack up to about eight amps. It charges with an input voltage of 11 to 18 volts DC. So this is an excellent device for powering uh, power tools or electronics uh, in a portable fashion when you don't have an electrical outlet or an extension cord handy. I won't necessarily always be able to bring this to class, but when I do, you're always welcome to use it. You can power your electronics or power, uh, power tools like the hand drill uh, the corded hand drill in particular, away from an electrical outlet. So that offers an element of convenience. 
An additional quote unquote off the menu tool that I might bring in occasionally is my 50 megahertz oscilloscope. Now this oscilloscope is quite sensitive. It's designed for uh, measuring all the way down to roughly one millivolt and it can measure all the way up to a 50 megahertz signal. It has two inputs. It offers external trigger triggering and single pulse analysis and it's generally a pretty awesome scope. So I'm gonna plug it in. I'll actually use the Energize toolbox to power it here. And uh, when it boots up, I will show you what you can do with it. Now that the oscilloscope is running, I'll show you some of the controls. As an example, I'll plug in the probe to the input here. And the first thing I'll show you on the probe is this switch here for attenuation. Now it's probably hard to see on the camera, but on one side of the switch, it says 1x, and on the other side, it says 10x. This is an attenuator, which allows you to measure relatively high voltages. So any voltage over about 100, or any voltage over about 20 volts, rather, you're going to want to use the 10x attenuation setting. If it's below 20 volts, you'll want to use the 1x attenuation setting. Let me show you an example. I've connected the scope probe to the mains with 10x attenuation enabled. As you can see, we have a sine wave on this signal. Now you can adjust the triggering point, which is where the point at which the oscilloscope locks on to the signal, to as high or as low as you want. If you set it too high though, the signal will dance around on the screen because the scope won't know where to trigger. That allows you to set any precision location for the triggering, and as you'll notice, its horizontal position offsets slightly depending on where the trigger point is selected. Additionally, you can change the horizontal time base, so this allows you to look at a larger section of the signal, or rather a lower frequency signal, or to look more closely at the signal for higher frequency signals or high frequency components of higher uh, signals. There's also a second input that you can enable. I haven't connected the probe to that, but you can see that a second waveform displays when you enable that. Now you can also press the measure button to actually measure the voltage being, uh, being read off. As you can see, the RMS voltage reads as 11.2 volts. Now since we had 10x attenuation enabled, this means that the voltage it's measuring is 112 volts AC RMS. That's roughly uh, accurate for this time of day. It's the middle of summer and everyone's air conditioner is on, so the house voltage is a little bit low right now. Other than that, you can also do a few other things. You can set single pulse triggering. So let me show you how that works. If I unplug my cable here and I enable single pulse triggering, well, what this does is it allows me to have the line trigger. Well, let me set the trigger point. If I set the trigger point here, it will, it will always be recording, but it will only stop the recording when the voltage rises above that trigger level. So when I plug in the, the lead, as you can see, I plugged in the lead and it recorded the signal immediately after I did that. This is excellent for reading out uh, the waveform from intermittently activating devices. So things that might only pulse every once in a while, you don't want to have to time your own uh, stopping of the signal right then, so you let the machine do it for you by triggering on single pulse. Well, I hope you guys learned something about these basic tools. Hopefully they'll be useful in uh, working on your final projects this year in FSC 100. And if you're not here from FSC 100, hopefully you learn something in general for all of your future projects. Now you may find that it's a little, little bit more difficult on your first go using some of these tools, but I always say try, try again and practice will make perfect. Eventually you'll be able to master them and get really good at it and uh, make uh, excellent use of these tools. So hopefully you uh, had an enjoyable time watching this video. I am really excited to see all of your final projects and I'm really excited to uh, get to know you guys this year and uh, I'm hoping I can do my best as UGTA in this class to really make it an awesome place to innovate and learn how to uh, construct materials together and build cool things. So thank you guys for watching. Thanks for watching my channel, Dielectric Videos, and I will see you next time.